Let's pray. Father, great indeed is the mystery of godliness. Your word reports to us that God was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, testified to among the nations, and now we get to behold the beauty of His glory. And so, Father, in the mystery of this godliness contained in Christ, transferred to His people, God, I pray that in the word of John this morning that you would help us to understand it better than we do. And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. As I mentioned last week that John 18 is, in my opinion, probably one of the more difficult chapters of John to read, not necessarily because the content is overly complicated or confusing, but because it is the chapter where we see multiple expressions of betrayal leveled against Christ. And as many of us know, as many of you have experienced, betrayal is one of the most unfortunate and maybe the most tragic marks of our fallen nature. We see it in our places of employment, where an employer betrays an employee, or an employee betrays an employer. We see it in marriage relationships, when a husband betrays a wife or a wife betrays her husband. We also, unfortunately, see it from time to time in the church. A shepherd who betrays the trust of his flock, or the flock betrays the trust of their shepherd. It is all very sad, all very deeply heartbreaking, but the most heartbreaking of all acts of human betrayal are those which are done against God. And in John 18, we see Jesus being betrayed not once, but multiple times, which ultimately leads him to the cross. Last week, we saw one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, at the center of a betrayal as he led Roman soldiers and officers of the Jewish elders into the meeting place in the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. And maybe what makes that betrayal even more tragic is the fact that Judas was tempted into this evil for only 30 pieces of silver, or in modern times, is the equivalent of about 400 bucks. This week, we will see an equally tragic betrayal, which comes through a series of denials. And in some ways, this strikes an even greater blow as the price which inspired it was far less than $400. So with that, let's read our text this morning, John 18, verses 10 through 27. And in the New American Standard Translation, it says this. Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him and led him to Annas first, for he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. And Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who kept the door 
said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there having a charcoal fire, for it was cold and they were warming themselves. And Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. And I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. And when he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? So Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Verse 25 says, Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. And we'll pause there this week. We begin our text this morning and close our text from this morning with the actions of one of Jesus' disciples by the name of Simon Peter. And so as we relay the events which occur here, I thought it good to remind ourselves of the background as well as the identity of who this disciple of Christ is. And the first thing that we come across regarding Simon Peter in Scripture is that we find him involved in his life's vocation as a fisherman. What a lucky soul. Make money for fishing? I mean, come on. Many of the Jewish people living around the Sea of Galilee were involved in this kind of occupation. This was how they made their living, uh, the fishing trade, and Peter was no exception. And we find this report about him in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, where it says, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Matthew point, paints the picture here that Simon, along with his brother Andrew, were just simply minding their own business, working hard, no doubt, doing what they had most likely done every other day, and were casting their nets into the sea in order to catch fish. But this day was not going to end like other days. Something very remarkable, even miraculous, we could say, took place as the Son of God, Jesus Christ, intervened into their lives, calling them to follow and changing the course of their lives forever. What a great day. When Jesus came walking by, calling them into a new type of fishing, a fishing that is for men's souls, the other remarkable thing which happened here was their response. It says, immediately Simon and Andrew left their nets in order to follow Jesus. Amazing. So with this encounter, we are introduced to Simon Peter in Scripture as he and his brother are called by Jesus. But another important element of Peter's life and 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 the nature of his character, which needs to be noted if we're going to gain a well-rounded understanding of who he is, is that of his name. When he was born, his parents did not give him the name of Peter. That came later. Instead, he was originally known as Simon Barjona. The first name Simon was a common name given to a lot of Jewish boys, and his last name, Barjona, just simply means the son of Jonah or the son of John, which designated the particular family that he 
belong to. We see his birth name used by Jesus in Matthew 16, 17, where it says, Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. But Simon Barjona came to be known by a different name after Jesus called him to be his disciple. We see this in John 1, 42 saying that he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John, Simon Barjona, but you shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter, Cephas being Aramaic. The story in which he earned this name is very interesting and also very important. One day as Jesus was stirring up a lot of attention amongst the people, And it seemed everybody was talking about this mysterious man from Nazareth. He turned to his disciples and asked them who the crowds of people were saying he was. Who do they say I am? In response, the disciples said this in Matthew 16, 14. They said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets, to which Jesus pressed his disciples further by asking this in verse 15, but who do you say I am? The crowds are saying this, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets, but you, my disciples, my inner circle of followers, who do you say I am? This is The great question which every man, woman, and child must wrestle with and must resolve for themselves. And the answer which came that day happened to be the correct one. And interestingly enough, it came from Simon Barjona. says this in Matthew 16, 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. (laughs) Well done, Peter. You got it right. So therefore, with this wise answer, Jesus said this in verses 17 through 18, saying, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So we see that upon Simon's spirit-inspired, faith-filled confession given to him by God the Father, Jesus marked the great event with the name Peter. Now, the significance of this is a bit difficult to see in English. But the Greek text behind the New Testament shows that there's a certain kind of play on words that is happening here in these verses because Peter in Greek is the word petros, and petros means rock. And what does Jesus say? You are Peter, petros, the rock. And upon the rock of this confession of faith that you just made, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, the church of Jesus Christ will be built, and even the gates of Hades will not be able to stand against it. So Simon Barjona, with his declaration that Jesus is the Christ, earns the name of Peter the Rock. But interestingly enough, though Peter got it very right on that day, There were other days when it wasn't so much. Peter had some challenges. In fact, there were other days when Peter got it very wrong. Most notably, probably, is the day when Peter failed to support the plan and the purpose of Jesus as the Christ, the anointed one sent to be the sacrificial lamb of God to atone for sinners. And on this day... Jesus called him by a different name, the name of Satan. Matthew again provides the details, Matthew 16, 21 through 23. 
It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. This must happen. He was teaching his disciples, this is what is going to happen and it must happen. I must go to Jerusalem. I must suffer. I must be killed. And three days later, I'm going to rise again. But Peter took him aside And began to rebuke him, rebuking Jesus for clarity there, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Much can be said about that, but the observant student of Scripture will notice that Jesus' commendation of Simon as Peter and the rebuke condemning his actions as those of Satan take place in the same chapter. In fact, they not only occur in the same chapter, but they happen in successive paragraphs. See, the first paragraph, you are Peter the rock. Upon the rock of your confession of faith, I will build my church. And then in the very next paragraph, get behind me, Satan. You aren't setting your interests on God, but rather on man's. Wow. So what we find in the life of Simon Peter, which is so frustrating, yet also at the same time very relatable, is that he often soars among the heights of great faith, yet at other times he exhibits great depths of the flesh, whereby he even allows himself to be the very mouthpiece of the devil. Wow. And so, with that brief overview of Simon Peter, much more can be said, but we'll leave it there for today. We turn back to the events of John 18. And in this chapter, which side of Peter do we see? Great heights of faith or great depths of the flesh? Unfortunately, what we see are great depths of the flesh as he makes attempts at self-preservation, which take on the substance of denial and ultimately betrayal of his allegiance to Christ. So we find, as we begin in verse 10 through 11, we find an initial sort of betrayal or denial. As it says this, Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Peter, once again, was trying to get in the way of God's plan. So as the soldiers recovered from falling down, right? We talked about that last week in the verses before this. Jesus made the profession of, I am, and they they fell down. And and, uh, now they're recovering from that. And for whatever reason, Simon Peter decides it'd be a good reason to spring into action. He draws his sword. Who knew disciples could carry swords, right? And he strikes the servant of the high priest and cuts off his ear. To which Jesus responds to Peter with a rebuke. Peter, put your sword away. There is a cup which the Father has given me to drink. A cup of pain, a cup of death but a cup which I must nonetheless drink fully. Don't get in the way, Peter. But following this, Jesus also allows himself here to be arrested and bound by the Roman soldiers. He's then taken to Annas, who was the former high priest before Caiaphas, who was the current high priest. And there was a a preliminary... Uh, court uh, hearing of sorts. And we see here that following behind, probably in the shadows so as to avoid being arrested themselves, it says were two of Jesus' disciples. 
One who isn't named, but most likely is John the Beloved. John doesn't refer to himself in his gospel. So most likely the the one who isn't named here is probably John. But also the other disciple, Simon, who is known as Peter the Rock. And at this point in the story, there is almost a hope, an expectation even, that maybe these two disciples are going to intervene. I mean, Simon's still got his sword probably, right? I mean... But whether by God's providence, most likely, or by some failure on their part, or possibly um, a mix of both, that is not to be. In fact, what we find is the exact opposite of faith-inspired boldness, especially in the actions of Peter. As Peter is given access into the court of Annas, It says there is a woman at the door, a a slave girl who is in charge of keeping the door. And something inspires her to ask Peter, are you also one of Jesus' disciples? Straightforward question, easily answered. And all of heaven holds its breath. Just like that day when Jesus had asked his disciples, who do you say I am? Would Peter step up and answer according to his namesake with great rock-like faith? Or would he lay to rest all doubts and speculations and declare that he is indeed a disciple of the Son of God? What would he say? Well, he answers and says very directly, very clearly, I am not. I am not his disciple. And almost to prove his point, he joins the very same officers who had arrested Jesus moments before in the garden so that he could warm himself around their fire. But those around the fire were also curious about Peter, so they too ask him, The very same question which the slave girl had asked. You are not also one of his disciples, are you? Just in case you were confused the first time you were asked, Peter. Just in case you misspoke in your answer to the woman at the door. Just in case you want to change your response, Peter. The question is given to you again. Are you Jesus' disciple? But sadly, Peter replies with the very same three words. I am not. And then a third opportunity for confession presents itself immediately after when a spark of recognition inspires another slave to approach Peter with, again, the same question. Hey, didn't I see you in the garden with Jesus? In fact, I think you are the very one who cut off my relative's ear. You are one of his disciples. But Peter the Rock belied his name and expressed himself more like shifting sand and denied for a third time that he was a disciple of Jesus Christ. In fact, Matthew, the parallel verses in Matthew tells us that Peter began to curse and to swear, saying, I do not know the blankety-blank man. And immediately a rooster crowed, marking perfectly the prophetic prediction which Jesus had given to Peter only a few hours earlier at the Last Supper. Peter had boldly, even rashly, declared his allegiance to Jesus Saying, I'll even go to death for you, Jesus. I will follow you no matter what. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are the Son of God. And nothing can tear me away from you. To which Jesus had replied, John 13, 38. Will you lay down your life for me, Peter? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. And now those words of Jesus have been fulfilled. Peter, you won't even make it through the night. 
let alone following me all the days of your life. So three times, even four times, if we count the scene with Malchus, Simon Peter is seen as denying the lordship of Christ, denying the plan of Christ, denying that he was his disciple and follower, denying even any knowledge of him at all. Gone is the bold, courageous words of faith. In their place is selfishness, faithlessness, and fear. And so we ask the question, what happened to Peter? What happened? And maybe even more importantly for those of us this morning who see maybe a little too much of Peter in our very own lives, how can his betrayal not be duplicated in us? How do we avoid falling into the same error that Peter fell into? And so to answer this, I think there are three lessons which can be drawn out of Peter's moment of weakness, which are incredibly instructive to the church. So I'll give them each to you successively, lessons to the church. And the first lesson which I believe we can draw out of Peter's life is that pride comes before the fall. Proverbs speaks this in Proverbs 16, 18, saying, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. In the case of Peter, we get a sense of this in him, pride, self-sufficiency, this uh, haughty spirit maybe that I can do it on my own power, my own strength. We get a sense of this in Peter as he declared to Jesus, the same cup which you are about to drink, I can drink it too. I can do this, Jesus, I'll follow you, I'll even drink the very same cup. To which Jesus had replied, really? Because what I see is that you won't even make it till morning without denying me three times. And so what this means for the Christian, for us, for our church is that there is no room for fleshly, carnal, arrogant, and prideful self-reliance. In fact, I would argue that the very essence of being a Christian is the confession that we need help. We are not self-sufficient. I need help. You need help. The best that we are able to come up with is sin. The very best of the best that I can present to God, is tainted by sin. Apart from Christ, Isaiah says, all of my good works are nothing more than filthy rags. In the words of Martin Luther, he said, without the redeeming help of Christ, the sum of all of our efforts, works, and activities, including the activities of the mind and the heart, is nothing more than snow-covered dung. It may look white, it may look pure, it may look sparkly on the outside, but apart from Christ, on the inside, there's another story. And so while I have no doubt that we all know this in our minds, we read it, we know it, I often wonder if we truly know it in our heart. It isn't wrong to be confident as long as our confidence is established on the right foundation. Far too often in the weakness of our flesh, our words and our actions would make it seem like the foundation of our confidence lies in ourselves and not in the Lord. And this, my friends, is a recipe for disaster. As we see the denials of Peter in John 18, I can't help but wonder... If the precursor to it all, the precursor to his denials, the precursor to his betrayal and his fall was foreshadowed by his pride in chapter 13, I believe it was. Therefore, if we are going to avoid betraying Christ, we must daily crucify our pride continually confess our need for him and constantly walk in sober humility. Lesson number two, 
The second lesson which I believe the church can learn from Peter's betrayal is the contributing factor of prayerlessness. The moments before Judas and the soldiers entered the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus, Matthew tells us that these were moments of prayer. It says this, Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus came with them, with the disciples, to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Therefore, remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So we see here that Jesus takes his inner circle of disciples. It says here, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which are James and John, so that they can pray and keep watch. But interestingly, after praying for most likely a short time, Jesus returns to his inner circle of three disciples. And this is what he finds, Matthew 26, 40. Jesus came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And said to Peter, So, you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The Spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. They had been given the charge, in fact, they'd been given the very great privilege and responsibility to go further into the garden with Jesus himself in order to keep watch and pray. But instead, they had fallen asleep. So Jesus, coming back, finding them asleep, he points out to them the reason why it is so important to remain in prayer. He says, so that you may not enter into temptation. Understand this, my disciples. The Spirit is willing, yes indeed, but your flesh is so very, very weak. Pray, keep watch, so that you don't fall into temptation. And they had fallen asleep. And amazingly, this scenario repeats itself two more times. Jesus goes off by himself to pray, returns, and finds the three asleep. And I think, you know, I point this story out to you so that I can suggest to you that possibly, probably, most likely it is a direct connection between between Peter's denial and Peter's prayerlessness. There is a direct link here, my friends. One of the great privileges of the Christian life is the gift of prayer. Not only does it provide a direct line of communication with our Creator, but it also provides moments of fellowship, which cannot be experienced any other way, in my my opinion. But also, it is one of the primary means for spiritual victory over the world, the devil, and our flesh. The Apostle Paul taught this to the church over and over again, saying such things as this in Ephesians 6, 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert, keyword alert, with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Through prayer, Paul says, show yourselves to be on the alert. Pray at all times. It's the same thing Jesus was trying to get across to Peter. Or Paul says this in Colossians 4.2. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping what? Alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Again, pray so that you may remain alert so that you may not fall into temptation. And therefore, to sum it up, Paul gives this very simple command in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. He says, pray without 
ceasing. Always. Without ceasing means without stopping. Continually, constantly. Live your life in an attitude and action of prayer. But yet, despite so much clear teaching, Old Testament, New Testament, about the necessity of prayer, I wonder how often the Lord finds His church asleep. And as a result, making itself deeply vulnerable to sin because of it. Which begs the question personally for each one of us, for you, for me, how much of our sin could be avoided if we merely committed ourselves to being more active in prayer. I wonder how much heartache, how much spiritual setback could be avoided if we just simply prayed more. I wonder how much heartache Peter could have avoided if he hadn't fallen asleep that night. Jesus had told them, keep watch, pray, so that you won't enter into temptation. Sure, the spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Therefore, we need to remain vigilant in prayer. So the second lesson from Peter is that if we are going to avoid temptation, the temptation of the flesh to betray our Lord and Savior, we must become people of unceasing prayer. The third lesson is that Peter's denial teaches us something about humanity, which is this, that we have a terrible weakness and practice of placing the fear of man over the fear of God. For Peter, even though he carried a sword and obviously wasn't afraid to use it, he was especially vulnerable to the fear of man. He was overly obsessed and concerned of what his peers thought of him. As he denied Christ that night, he was with a group of people gathered around the fire, and they asked him about his involvement with Jesus. Are you one of his disciples? And it says in Matthew that with an oath, he swore that he did not know the man. He affirmed in the strongest way possible to this group of people that he did not know Jesus. I swear it to you. But with this oath, it was a false oath inspired by his concern for what they thought of him and how he might be treated because of it. Now, as a good Jew, and as one who had spent three years at the feet of Christ, he knew what it meant to make a false vow, a false oath. It was a breach of the law. It was a violation of the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness. It was sin before a holy and righteous God. But yet, in the immediacy of the moment, Peter seems to have had a greater fear of man rather than a fear of God. He was willing to break the commandments of God in order to protect himself in front of this group of people. Scripture says this, Proverbs 29, 25, that the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. And Jesus also brings this whole thing into perspective in Luke, Luke 12, 4 through 5. And Jesus says, and I don't, I don't think he's being condemning here at all. I think Jesus is just being encouraging, I think. At least that's how I read this. But he says this, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will warn you of whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And unfortunately, the fear of man has been a great stumbling block to God's people throughout the ages, throughout the history of mankind. We see it over and over again in Scripture. 
It was the fear of man that inspired Abraham to say that his wife Sarah was only his sister. Not once, but twice. (laughs) I can only imagine what the conversation around the dinner table was like that night. So, you told him I was your sister, huh? (laughs) It was the fear of man that caused the entire nation of Israel to trust in wicked pagan Egypt instead of the Lord when Assyria came knocking on their front door. It was the fear of man, fear of the Pharisees more precisely, that prevented the parents of the man born blind from confessing that Jesus indeed had healed their son. We don't know how he can see now. Might have been Jesus, I don't know. I'm not willing to say, because you'll put me out of the synagogue. The fear of man became a snare to them. They had a great opportunity to confess Jesus as Lord. But the fear of man became a snare. And I believe here that the fear of man was a contributing factor which led to Peter's betrayal that night with words of swearing and cussing. And to be sure, mankind can be especially cruel and fearsome, very creative at times in bringing harm against others. But this is where we must cling fiercely to the big picture of our existence. Pointed out by the opening psalm that I read this morning in Psalm 27. It says this, the Lord is my light. He is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers, evil men, came upon me to devour my flesh, David says... My adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Not confident in himself, not confident in mankind, but confident in the Lord who is his light and his salvation and the defense of his life. And if we are to maintain our allegiance to the Lord in these dark days, we must come to grips with this problem. We must learn that the fear of the Lord trumps any kind of fear of man. Okay. So with the story of Peter's denial, there's much, I believe, that the church can learn. I've given you three. There's probably several more. And um, I think if we're honest, as we read the life of Peter, um, this can be very challenging, probably because we see a little too much of Peter in our own lives. So therefore, in our conclusion this morning, I want to bring us back to center by drawing our attention on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, because Jesus has a huge part that he plays in our text this morning. So the first thing that I want to share out of this in hope for the wayward soul is that Jesus speaks openly. In John, as Jesus is brought to the first of several trials, he is questioned regarding two things it says here, his disciples and what he had been teaching. Regarding his teaching, Jesus essentially points out that it really isn't necessary for them to ask about it because Jesus had been teaching in public places, in the synagogues and even in the temple itself. He wasn't hiding out in some backwoods, remote location like some kind of private secret society of sorts closed off from the rest of the world, but rather when he taught, he taught publicly, which means that it was accessible to any who would come and listen. And in this is a great encouragement for us because we believe If I can throw a a word at you, we believe in the doctrine of the perspicuity of Scripture, which just simply means that through the grace of Christ, according to the power of the Holy Spirit in us, by the means of His infallible Word, that God is able to speak clearly and we are able to understand it. Perspicuity. 
That's all that means. Furthermore, it means that we do not have to find some special priest who will interpret the will of God to us and for us. And this was one of the great problems with the Roman Catholic Church, and to a certain degree still is today. It became the inspiration, in a sense, for the Protestant Reformation, led by the likes of William Tyndale and Martin Luther. They had a very deep conviction that God's word was able to be understood by the common person if they had the opportunity to read it. So they set out to translate the Bible into the common language of the people, which absolutely revolutionized the church and freed it from the abuses of the Roman Catholic Church. And so my point is just simply this, that in your edification, hopefully this morning, that Jesus has spoken and is speaking plainly in this book. Take it, read it, and be transformed in the renewing of your mind and heart by it. That is a great encouragement. Secondly, we see here that Jesus speaks truthfully. As Jesus continues to be interrogated, evidently they thought he was being insubordinate, maybe disrespectful, and so one of the officers, it says, struck him. In response, Jesus replies with a challenge in verse uh, 18, 23. He says, if I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? In his response, what is interesting is not necessarily what Jesus said, but what he didn't say. Because as I'm reading this and I'm thinking, well, I kind of would expect him to say something about how wrong it is to hit the Son of God. Or maybe say something about judgment and the wickedness of mankind's heart that would lead a person to strike a righteous man. But instead, he makes a defense regarding truth. He challenges the officer who struck him by saying, if I spoke falsely or wrongly, then maybe you have the right to strike me. But if so, prove it. Prove that I spoke wrongly. But instead, if I have spoken rightly, why do you reject it by striking me? And in this lies another great reality about our Lord and Savior, which deeply encourages the heart, if you'll allow it. That not only does Jesus speak openly, but when he speaks, he speaks truthfully. And in an age of lies, this is incredibly important. Though they struck him, abused him, and mocked him, never once did he speak anything falsely in which they were justified in their judgments against him. And we'll pick up on this next week. We'll see it further. That yes, it is Jesus on trial before the world, but it is also truth which is being put on trial. More on that next week. So, as Jesus speaks openly, the even greater encouragement, in my opinion, is that when he speaks, he is speaking truthfully. Why? Because he himself is truth. As John 14, 6 declares, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So therefore, that means for us, church, that what Jesus has spoken in this book, we can trust it perfectly. <laughs> Good, you're still awake. <laughs> it's been like two hours. <laughs> no. Thirdly and finally, last point of edification for your faith this morning is that Jesus speaks louder sometimes when he doesn't speak at all. As we watch this preliminary trial give way to the trial under Caiaphas, then that gives way to the trial under Pontius Pilate, which then leads him to King Herod, from King Herod back to Pontius Pilate and the crowd of Jews. One remarkable thing about it all 
is how little Jesus spoke in his defense. Very rarely, as they were accusing him, mocking him, slandering him, did he ever speak up and defend himself. In fact, the Sanhedrin council got really upset because he just wouldn't speak. Can't you hear all of these accusers? Why don't you open your mouth and say something? And what we conclude about this is not that Jesus didn't have anything to say, or not that he had any right to say it, but instead that he simply refused to open his mouth, which was in fulfillment of the prophetic word. Isaiah 53, 7. He, the Messiah, was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. Jesus was silent. And in a way, this speaks even louder to our lives. And the remarkable thing about all of this, as we close, is Peter's perspective on it all. We started with Peter, we're going to end with Peter, just as John does. Because with Peter, you see, not to spoil the end of the story, but at the end of the Gospel of John, when Jesus appears to Peter in his resurrected state, we find that Peter's broken fellowship with Christ is restored. Not only was he forgiven and redeemed from this terrible night of betrayal, but Jesus also calls him in that moment to the ministry of God's word and feeding the sheep of God. And from this, we have the books of 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And in 1 Peter, he relates to us his perspective regarding this night and the next day of crucifixion. And he says this in 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. He says, for you, church, have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. And while suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Like a lamb being led to the slaughter, he was silent. Like a sheep being sheared, he was silent. He was being reviled, but he didn't revile in return. He was suffering greatly, deeply, unjustly so, but he uttered no threats. Instead, he kept entrusting himself to the Father who judges all things righteously and perfectly. Peter continues on in verses 24 through 25, and this is really what I want you to see. He goes on to say, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, by his stripes we are healed, Isaiah And verse 25 says this, For you were continually straying like sheep. But now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. And knowing the background of Peter's life and his denials of Christ this night, I am absolutely stunned by the impact of verse 25. Peter says, you are continually straying like sheep. You are wayward. You denied him. You betrayed him. And how is Peter able to say such bold things? He knew from experience, because he too was a wayward sheep. Pride, prayerlessness, the fear of man, and many other sins caused him to go astray and betray his Lord and Savior. But now, by the grace of God in Christ, he says the guardian and shepherd of our souls is willing and able to bring us back. Amazing. 
And I just wonder this morning, maybe as we've read the story of Peter, maybe you have been convicted of a certain element of waywardness in your own life. Personally, I, I find the story of Peter very hard to read. And I think that's probably so for most of us at one level or another. And so this morning, I, I say to you, if you've been convicted, I want to encourage you to listen to that voice. Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. So therefore, don't ignore His voice. It is grace. It is mercy. And so instead, heed the words of 1 Peter, which shows Christ was silent before His accusers giving us an example in which to follow, but also gains for us a redemption to be possessed eternally. So therefore, in these next few moments, as we allow our hearts to be sifted before the Lord as we celebrate communion, if you find that you have wandered from the faith or maybe have grown complacent in your prayer life, or have become prideful in your self-sufficiency, or maybe have even flat out denied Christ before the watching world, now is the time to confess and be healed. God did it for Peter. He'll do it for you. Amen. Worship team, would you come? The rest of you, would you pray? Father, we thank you that you have given us such vivid illustrations, examples in your word, which both warns us and also encourages us. And Father, this morning as we consider the life of Peter God, it's hard to come away from that without feeling a deep sense of conviction because we are a people who have all fallen short of the glory of God. But God, we also understand as we look at the vivid picture of Jesus and the salvation which He offers, Lord, we understand that there is redemption for those who go wayward. And so, Father, I pray this morning that as your spirit moves, I, I believe your spirit is moving through your word as you promise. God, I pray that as hearts are convicted, Father, that those same hearts would confess and be healed. Your word says that if any one of us sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin when we confess that sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so, Father, in the next few moments during this song, God, I pray that you would examine our lives and, Father, that you would heal our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.